So let's see. Okay, where are we? Um, oh, we have two likes already. That's good. So, hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> hello. Hello. Hi. Nice to see all of you. We are still waiting for two more minutes to let people in. And then we will start with the seminar. Everything okay? Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm ready. Great. Yeah, that's no yeah. Please uh, mute your microphones because otherwise we will have some echoes or disruptions here but uh, actually you should be muted, muted when you enter this meeting i hope Okay. Hello, everybody. We will start in one minute, still waiting for the last participants to join, but we are already 77 participants now and probably more watching on YouTube. And I hope all of you can hear me well and see me well. And you can always use the chat of Zoom or YouTube give your comments or questions and um, I think we can now start the YouTube uh, and Zoom webinar. Welcome everybody to this webinar um, on peatlands in the new cap, potential synergies for sustainable regional economies with climate and biodiversity benefits. Uh, honorable um, MEPs, uh, participants, uh, welcome here in the name of Wetlands International, um, represented by Leah Apollo, University of Galway in Ireland, represented by uh, Neil Brocklin, and the Greisart Meyer Centre, uh, represented by Franziska Tanneberger. My name is uh, Jan Peters. I'm a policy expert at the Greisart Meyer Centre and will host uh, this meeting um, here today. We will have one hour on Zoom. So if you're lucky, uh, you could enter the, the Zoom meeting and can be with us here. But the uh, meeting is also live streamed on YouTube um, with the invitation. We also sent out the link so you can also follow us live on YouTube and also use the comment line there. And the whole web webinar will be, be recorded and uh, made available afterwards uh, on our YouTube, of the YouTube channel of the Greifswald Meyer Center. Uh, which we, you will easily find. The webinar today uh, substitutes uh, actually a face-to-face -face meeting, which was planned for March in Brussels at the European Parliament. Um, but unfortunately, you all know that due to the COVID-19 situation that was canceled just a few days before the whole parliament was closed for meetings. So we couldn't um, host this meeting, but we decided that the topic of peatlands in the cap and other um, EU policies is so important that we would like to go for uh, for having this this webinar today. Um, the 
narrative of the webinar will be that we will explain the role of peatlands for multiple environments, the targets for climate, biodiversity, water, and others. We will highlight possibilities and best practice for sustainable management and also agriculture on uh, peatlands, including paludiculture. And we will also discuss and inform about policy options on the EU and the member state level, especially in regard to the CAP the reform, also, um, of course, in regard to the Green New Deal. The seminar will be, um, uh, will be um, structured in two blocks at the beginning. We will have uh, the scientific background and uh, learn about technical challenges um, of, uh, of paludiculture in peatland, climate-friendly peatland management. And in the second block, we will highlight policy options. We will have, we collected some statements from uh, members of parliaments from different member states and parties. And we will present our policy paper, which we put together in a broad network of uh, scientific organizations and NGOs at the beginning of this year, um, which is also available online. You will find the link um, in, the, in the chat and also in the invitation. So it, each block will be um, formed by videos from practitioners, scientists or policymakers, uh, followed by a question and answer uh, session. Due to the short time, we only uh, have one hour, we would like to ask you to use the chat uh, of Zoom or on YouTube, the comment line, uh, to raise your questions. We will collect them there. I have an assistant here, Sophie Hirschelmann, in the GMC office, who will help me to collect uh, the questions also from YouTube. And then we will select them and direct them to the speakers, and they will briefly answer, answer to them. But the chat will be also recorded and saved afterwards. Um, so we will follow up all the comments and questions afterwards. And if you would like to get in contact with us, um, you can always feel, feel free to do so. And we will also answer questions and, and your, uh, your option, uh, opinions and views later. And to, to um, allow a smooth um, run of the seminar, of the webinar, I would like to ask you to mute your mi microphone throughout the webinar. Uh, so that we don't have any echoes and problems here. So uh, please don't forget to get in contact to us whenever you want. Afterwards, we will share our contact details also in the chat, and you will also you also find it in the invitation. Now um, I will start with the first block, um, showing scientific background and technical challenges of climate-friendly peatland use. My name is Tom Yearly, I'm uh, an organic farmer living here just outside from Shampoo. I'm farming on the shores of Lake Island, just at the foot of the Arena Valley. This is an area of the lowland race bog, so this was one of the areas where in the past, at some stage, there would have been turf quick by hand. We're getting a study done on it, uh, a hydrological study, which will be able to tell us which way the water is flowing off the bog and at what speed it's flowing off it. Because what we intend to do is to block up the perimeter drains to hold the water in it. That's the only thing that a bog is happy, is when it's wet. Because uh, if, you, if you drain out a bog, it's basically you're it's like putting a cut on your own hand and draining out the blood. You're taking all the life out of it. You need to have a bog really wet for it to be working well. That's when the mosses are growing and it's all, it's all about mosses on a bog. They're what build up the peat. We, um, we don't fully appreciate them because they're growing at such a slow rate. The pea the is being laid down approximately at about a millimetre a year. So um, that's approximately the same rate that coral is growing at in the sea. And a lot of people are, you know, very protective of the corals in the sea. So what we, what we have here is growing at the same rate. So we have to do our best to preserve that. 
but we're looking there at the, the bog behind the little bit of woodland and uh, in order to get material to raise that embankment it had to come from somewhere so this area here became a donor site and uh, the end result was that we, we shaped it to become a pond we left a little island in the middle of the pond and uh, the water is about, about seven foot or so deep just out from the island but it, it comes up gradually the whole way so it comes in at an angle of about 30 degrees which if you're digging a pond it's very important to consider how wildlife is going to get into it and going to get back out of it so an angle of about 30 degrees or a slope of about 30 degrees it works out the best one of the habitats that we have here on the farm is a, an area of lowland raised bog and uh, we've got a study done on that the last while and there's so many different species of moss on it and so many other plants on it but each one is telling you something about how water is flowing on the bog you know most people just look at a bog and say ah big brown area so there's nothing happening there but there's a, a, an unbelievable amount of stuff happening in front of your eyes but it's just that we, we, we've lost that as a boss sense of connectedness with the land and with the soil under our feet and i think once once we get back up and get that re-established we We'll be on our way to getting uh, a healthier planet. So this was uh, Tommy Early from the uh, a farmer from Ireland who explained um, his um, challenges with managing peatland fa um, farmland. And now at next we will get an overview of what is happening um, with the products produced on grain peatlands live from a supermarket uh, in Poland. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Viktor Kotowski. I'm a coordinator of the Repeat Project. Pitlands are wonderful ecosystems. Uh, in the Repeat Project, we are studying their recovery after drainage. Is it possible to restore pitlands after they have been drained? These are wetlands in which plant biomass accumulates as peat, actively removing carbon from the atmosphere. Most of these emissions are due to food production, due to agricultural drainage and due to uh, emissions from uh, peat extraction for horticulture. Let's go where, where these emissions are. We are in the diary section of the shop. Uh, this milk, uh, most of it has been produced uh, on meadows established on drained peatlands. In Poland we have drained uh, uh, 84 percent of our peatlands, most of them for agriculture. Uh, one kilogram of cream is about 50 kilograms of peat burn CO2 emissions. This is crazy, this is a lot. Ironically, this cheese is called Gouda. It is Gouda cheese produced in Poland on the license perhaps from the Netherlands and it is produced like gold, like the Dutch Gouda on drained peatlands in the Jebza Valley. The milk factory in Grajevo collects milk from farmers who uh, use drained peat meadows for uh, milk production. All fresh vegetables uh, that you can buy in the supermarkets uh, are grown in greenhouses uh, uh, in the south of Europe. They are produced in Spain or Italy. And they are almost all, entirely all, grown on peat. This peat comes from uh, Canada or Baltic states. It's uh, excavated on virgin living peat plants uh, after drainage and after complete destruction of the peatland ecosystem. And if you buy plants uh, for your garden, they are also produced in, in pure peat. Even if you want to grow your own food on balcony or in the pots uh, on the terrace, and if you buy potting soil in the supermarket, you buy peat. This is peat, 100% peat-based uh, potting soil. Yeah, if we uh, are serious about Paris Agreement and we want to limit our emissions uh, by 50% within the next uh, 10 years, actually, and to zero within 40 years, we have we urgently need to stop draining peatlands and uh, uh, stop making people responsible uh, for peat emissions. And I do hope that uh, the reform of common agricultural policy can achieve it, can bring us this instrument. So I wish you a very fruitful workshop. I hope you can uh, find out how to help to rewet peatlands. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will try to be online to stay with you.
Yeah, that was Viktor Kotowski from um, Warsaw University from supermarket in Poland. In the next video, we will see Anke Günther from University of Rostock and Franziska Tanneberger explaining from the scientific uh, perspective why peatlands are important um, for uh, the carbon circle and uh, what peatlands have to do with greenhouse gas emissions. Like all farmers, when you see you have water coming onto your land, you immediately think you want to clean. But now I understand how peat bogs work, I now buy it. If I can keep the water on the bog, then I can farm working with nature happily next to the bog. And the lowland raised bogs are found in the lowlands and they tend to form a dome as the peat accumulates and that peat accumulates over thousands of years. Blanket bogs require much more rainfall and they tend to blanket the countryside at higher altitudes where we've got very large amounts of rain coming down. Peatlands can have quite a massive effect on climate change. Where peatlands have been drained and they are drying out, they put carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere at quite a fast rate because the peat we're standing on contains about 50% carbon. So as that dries out, it actually puts it into the atmosphere. So it's adding to the potential for climate change. So what we're trying to do is actually hold that carbon in place by re-wetting the peatlands up and actually accumulating carbon over a long period of time. Peatland restoration uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions and that obviously reduces the rate of climate change. And the thing about climate change and flooding is that we anticipate that climate change will increase the likelihood and the intensity of flooding in, in the future. So of course anything um, that reduces that rate of change, such as peatland restoration, and can only have a positive effect. The other benefit, of course, of peatland restoration is that we're often restoring you know, eroded bare peatland with vegetation, with peatland vegetation. And we do know that that vegetation actually slows down um, the rate of overland flow and allows that overland flow to infiltrate into soils, again reducing the amount of water that's actually reaching the river network. And it's difficult for farmers not to just think drainage, but to think how can I deal with that water without putting it all into my field drains. So what I would say is, um, it sounds a bit perverse, but if there's water coming onto your land as a result of seeping off a bog, why not think about stopping it coming onto your, your good uh, productive land and just keep it on the bog? I've been uh, uh, using controlled grazing and the cattle have made a huge difference to this ground and it's now relatively good, particularly for my kind of cattle, uh, grazing in the summer. Put a bund, we put a, um, a mound around a low part of one of my hay fields, which previously was really difficult to make hay because it was always wet. To create, if you like, a kind of pool, a pond, so that when the water runs off the bog, it's caught in this pool. Any overtopping doesn't go into my field drains. The other major work has been a series of four weirs and dams down the, the main water course that drains from the bog. So the water gets caught uh, at the weir and then is pushed onto the, the wetland. I would recommend restoring peatland because I, I, I do think that there are genuine long-term benefits to it and I think anyone who's got degraded peatland should really have a look. Every bit of ground is going to be different, there will be a huge variation in the expense and the costs involved but because of the general public goods it will, it will deliver whether it's clean water or climate change or whatever it's well worth looking at. Yeah, these were, of course, not the scientists from northeastern Germany, but the best practice examples from rewetting peatlands uh, in Scotland, in the UK, which is not part of the uh, European Union anymore, but still, uh, of course, a blueprint also for all of us in the European member states. And, uh, but, of course, we won't miss out on the, um, on the scientific side. Um, we will watch that video later, but before we will have another video showing best practice um, of paludic culture presented by Aldart van Werden. Uh, 
mein Name ist Aldert van Weren. Ich betreibe hier eine kleine Landwirtschaft mit Rohrkolben und äh, mache das ungefähr seit vier Jahren und äh, versuche das auch im weiteren Feld bekannt zu machen. Hier wächst der Rohrkolben, in diesem Fall der große Rohrkolben. Und aus dieser Rohrkolben können wir diese Produkte herstellen. Zum Beispiel diese Einblasdämmung, die hier drin verarbeitet werden kann. Äh, diese Fasern können zu solchen Platten verarbeitet werden kann, wo man Autoverkleidungen von machen kann. Aber auch magnesitgebundenes Isoliermaterial, wo man Häuser mit bauen kann. Wir ernten hier die Rohrkolbenpflanze komplett und zwar machen wir das heute mit einem kleinen Zeiger. Das ist ein Ballonreifenfahrzeug, was selber nur zweieinhalb Tonnen wiegt und jeder Reifen hat noch einen hohen Abtrieb, Auftrieb, wenn er im Wasser fährt. Also der richtet kaum Schaden an ans Feld, der Boden wird geschont und der kann Bündel mähen, wo der komplette Pflanze ist. Alles Oberirdische wird abgeschnitten, das sind die Blätter, die Stängel und diese komischen Dolden, wo diese tausend, hunderttausende Samen vor einer Pflanze drin sitzen. Und wir selber machen da aus einer Einblasdämmung. Sag mal, das organische Material ist weiter weggerottet, oxidiert unter Einfluss von Sauerstoff. Und das führt dann zu einer Verschwarzung. Es ist eine Art von Verbrennung, kann man sagen. Und sag mal, diese Mat Verlust an Materialien, die damit einhergeht, ist auch der Grund, dass es diese enorme Treibhausgasemissionen gibt. Dieser Rohrkolbenanbau müsste aus diesem, wie sage ich, aus diesem Pilotstadium rauskommen. Da gibt es ganz viele Pilotfelder, Untersuchungen, es hat sich alles gezeigt, es funktioniert, es läuft und jetzt muss es halt hochskaliert werden und industriell umgesetzt werden. Und da braucht es jetzt die richtigen Leute, die damit reingehen. Das maßgeblichste Rohstoff, was ich jetzt auch heute hier erfahren habe, ist das größte Problem, den Rohstoff in ausreichender Menge zu generieren. Uh, four years ago, four and a half years ago, I, I bought this. Then uh, he is invited to have a barbecue here when the weeds were. So, now there we learned a little bit about paludiculture from Aldat and colleagues um, from northeastern Germany growing a tail. And please don't forget, uh, use the Zoom chat or the uh, YouTube comments to uh, raise questions, uh, put comments. Um, we will be here to discuss that after the next video. Um, we will have all the... Um, uh, all the speakers from the videos in this webinar so they will be able to answer your questions or react to your comments so please use the chat or the comment line now um, of course we will also see the video from the scientists Tanke Günther from the University of Rostock and Franziska Tannenberger from the University of Geisel and Partner in Geisel Biocenter. We both work with Project Wetscapes, currently funded by the European Social Fund here in Northeast Germany. And we are standing in one of our research sites in the uh, River Valley of the River. Uh, this 
site. Uh, some 20 years ago it was used for agriculture. It was drained, fertilized, plowed, and uh, then revetted in the course of an EU-funded life project. And here we can study now uh, the long-term effects of revetting. And we know uh, by data collected at the site and the other sites, we know uh, much better how these uh, peatlands develop and what benefits and services they provide actually. Um, and this is important um, not only for scientists, but also in the course of the reform of the Common Agricultural Policy, which is currently being discussed and uh, crucial for the condition of peatlands uh, in the European Union. One of the biggest benefits of peatland regretting is um, the climatic effects that wet peatlands have, to have compared to drained peatlands. They are more climate. In our project, we use such closed chambers to measure the greenhouse gas emissions from this area. And this works by creating an enclosed gas volume where we can analyze the concentrations of greenhouse gases like this and the change over time tells us the rate in which greenhouse gases are emitted or taken up by the soil. We do this for all three major greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And in our project we already collected over 1100 measurements in this area and uh, combine those to have manual estimates of the emission and uptake of greenhouse gases. And by combining all three greenhouse gases, we get the thing that is called emission factor. Our measurements show that this area in some years is a small greenhouse gas source, and in some years it is a small greenhouse gas sink, so it's more or less climate neutral. It can be a sink, but um, this is not the major benefit we have here for the climate. Um, before the peatland was rewetted, we had an emission of 27 tons per hectare and year of CO2 equivalents because it was an intensively used deep drain grassland. And just by being climate neutral now, we already mitigated a lot of those emissions. Another uh, argument that's often thought to be against peatland regretting is the emission of methane. Because in rewetted peatlands, like pristine peatlands, methane is again produced and emitted from the soil. And this is, in the short term, a very strong greenhouse gas. Our studies show that um, this is not a problem in terms of the climatic benefits of a peatland that is rewetted. Because methane is a very short lived greenhouse gas that disappears from the atmosphere within a few decades, while carbon dioxide from the drained peatlands will remain in the atmosphere over thousands of years. So every decade that we wait to re-wet a peatland um, actually accumulates carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and this has a warming effect that cannot easily be um, taken back by the re-wetted peatlands. So in conclusion, the earlier we re-wet peatlands, the better it is for the climate. The challenge is big in the European Union. About uh, 200 megatons uh, per year of greenhouse gases are emitted from drained peat soils. Uh, most comes from agricultural use soils. And looking at agriculture, about one third of the emissions attributed to agriculture are from drained peat soils, which make up only about 3% of the agricultural land. So it is also a big opportunity for agriculture to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We heard a lot about emissions. Uh, there are other important aspects uh, from peatland rebetting, for example, nitrate release. We know that uh, the drained uh, peatland uh, would release about 20 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in a year. In a rebetted site like here, it is maybe between 0 and 5 kilograms. There's a big reduction in uh, nitrate release and thus uh, improvement in water quality of the surrounding waters. Rewetted peatlands also help cooling the landscape and provide um, retention space uh, in flooding events. And uh, not the least, they um, harbor fire uh, specific and uh, often threatened biodiversity. We can hear a lot of typical birds like uh, warblers, uh, reed bunting singing, a blue throat monster singing, uh, cranes passing by. So there's a lot of beautiful biodiversity also in rewetted peatlands. 
our site here demonstrates that uh, society gets uh, a big amount of benefits from people to betting and now it is the time that EU policy um, is uh, required to um, help landowners, help farmers, uh, help the countries in the European Union to um, stimulate, to start this transformation process from drainage to revetting of peatlands and not to prevent it any longer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, with this video uh, from the unique, uh, authentic uh, research site, very windy in northeastern Germany, close to the Baltic Sea coast in the peatland, we now close the first block, or at least the inputs in the first block, and we will now come to question and answers. We already got some questions and comments in the chat and you are welcome of course to to add to them so i i had a look and um there was a question are farmers also paid for the carbon store so can they earn a living from being so-called carbon farmers um maybe francisca you can quickly answer to that thank you very much um, it depends, of course, on the region or country where you are. There are carbon farming schemes now developing. What is already existing are uh, crediting schemes for carbon credits from peatland revetting. There are methodologies, there are regional schemes um, in the UK, in, in Germany, for example, um, in, uh, in Switzerland. But this is still only emerging and there are little examples that farmers already benefit from it. But this is, of course, a, a wide field of uh, potential activities also for policy to develop such schemes, especially now in the framework of uh, the CAP. Yeah, thank you very much, Francisca. Then we have another question on cattail. Um, can cattail also help the restoration? Is it also beneficial for biodiversity or is it just creating a new form of monoculture? Um, maybe Aldat van Veren, can you quickly answer on that? Yes, um, uh, the growing cattail as we do it, uh, it's almost like a natural ecosystem. So all birds, all insects and partly also fish or fish breed uh, which you will find in a natural uh, wetland, you will also find in a, in a good uh, maintained and managed uh, artificial uh, wetland. So uh, yes, this is very good for biodiversity. Thank you, Aldat. Um, then we have a more general question on paludiculture. What other plants can be grown? And also on YouTube, we had the question, are there also edible plants? and what are the markets uh, for paludiculture? Um, maybe I would like to ask Francisca again to answer on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a very wide range of opportunities and you're very welcome to learn more about that from uh, resources, for example, uh, from uh, our websites at Greifswald Meyer Center. We have also a database of potential paludiculture plants with more than 100 plant portraits. Um, of course, the most typical plants are uh, tall grasses, sedges, a reed, for example, is very typical. Um, but then if you move on to edible uh, things, um, that could be, um, it can be animals. So there are water buffaloes, for example, grazing on revetted peatlands, um, which are, which produce uh, or <laughs> provide meat and also milk. Uh, and then for the edible plants, the berries are most important, especially if you think of the more Nordic, Nordic peatlands, um, there's a wide range of berries uh, growing on wet uh, peat sites and there are also markets for this. Um, you all remember the, the gems, the liquors from, from these berries. And for the markets, also one example relating to Aldert's uh, film uh, about the cattail, a similar plant is, is uh, common reed. And for example, in a country such as Germany, where we still have a lot of roofs um, produced from this plant, uh, I exactly now sit in a house with a roof made of reed, um, and only 15% um, of the reed that is used as a building material in Germany uh, comes from Germany at the moment. Most is imported from Romania, also from China. So there are markets, but these, uh, the raw material is missing at the moment. 
Yeah, thanks, Francisca. Then there are a lot of questions here on the scientific uh, basis um, about microorganisms eating the peat and creating emissions. I think we should keep these questions and uh, clarify on that uh, later on in the bilateral discussions um, as it goes more into depth. But there's a question on the use for of um, Global warming potential, methane, CO2 balances, and uh, how that looks for, especially for cattail. Uh, maybe Anke, can you quickly say some words about that? Um, so the, I saw the question on the use of global warming potential over 100 years or longer. Um, I don't really know how to answer that because, of course, global warming potential 100 years is still a very big standard in the political context. Um, from a scientific view, it could be better to use longer time frames because then the short-term effect of methane isn't punished so much. But it seems like um, there's a lot of movement in that discussion right now. So for all practitioners, I don't know... Um, really what to recommend is because you have to stick to the standards and of course um, cattails only grow when uh, there's a lot of water so carbon dioxide emissions will be stopped but um, methane produced but that's then the question against that long and short-term greenhouse gas where the short-term greenhouse gas methane is not as um, severe I don't know if that answers the question. I, you could write me maybe. Yeah, thank you very much. I, th I think it gave some additional information, but maybe you get in bilateral exchange uh, later on that. Um, then we had questions. Um, on what is the situation at the moment in Ireland? Are there some experienced from cut over box cultivated with uh, polluted culture species? Uh, Neil, can you quickly say some words about that? You have to unmute. Have you? Hello, sorry about that. Bit of a problem with the unmuting. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? I was I was actually involved in um, okay. the YouTube side of things. <laughs> okay. Um, there were some questions. What are the activities going on in Ireland on cut over box? Are there any um, experience and research pilots going on there? Yeah. Um, well, in terms of cut over bogs, uh, part of the Care Peat project, which I'm involved with, and Terry Morley, who I think is here. Um, we're, we're, we'll be looking at, at various different types of bogs. Um, we were looking at a, um, you know, I, I mean, it's it's mainly sort of commercial bogs we're looking at or commercial commercially used bogs, um, but we're looking at all different types of bogs within the context of the policy papers that we're doing. So yes, of course, we're looking at the Irish situation. Okay, thank you. Then there is. Uh, um quite detailed uh, comment and question by Christian Gebele from the German Farmers Association. What are the prospective approaches and solutions to ensure economically viable agricultural land management, uh, especially in peatland areas in the future? Um, because farmers want to develop their agriculture's business on a solid economic perspective. And there's also a comment from, from the UK, from Sarah Johnson, um, that actually uh, in UK there's a similar situation of a chicken and egg, egg situation um, where you where it's difficult to develop the market until there's a reliable supply of products and that's actually the same what we have also learned in the in the movie about or in the video about cattail farming farming uh, from Aldat that the, actually um, the the supply of uh, biomass is not but there at the moment because nobody is growing that. But, um, maybe Francisca, you can say a few more words on that. Yeah, thank you. I think it's already kind of bridging to the second part of the webinar when we will talk more about the, the policy options. And uh, of course, uh, the common agricultural policy is crucial for this because at the moment farmers uh, on rebatted peat soils are discriminated. Um, there are many cases where such farmers 
in case they agree even to rebetting and having higher water tables, um, they do not get uh, direct payments, they do not get all the additional kinds of support because the land is not considered as eligible um, for these payments. And this is something that must be changed, otherwise um, the, the upscaling, the uh, large areas of degraded peatlands we have in the European Union uh, will probably stay in such a condition in the next funding period. And that's why it's now so timely to, to discuss this also with uh, various EU institutions. Uh, and then, of course, it's always more costly for the pioneers. I think Aldert, for example, here in our team, he can tell everybody. Um, but um, we have, of course, the hope that uh, with time passing and with more pioneers coming and following um, that we find better ways how to actually um, uh, get into these markets and uh, produce uh, cheaper, um, have cheaper uh, products then and uh, to make it uh, profitable um, um, at, at last, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Francisca. We have many more questions here, also some going very much into detail, uh, scientific questions. As I said, we will record all of them. Please continue to put your questions and comments in the chat. But now we have to move on. Um, actually, Francisca already <laughs> gave it a go um, to move on to the second uh, section. As in the first block, we focused mostly on the um, scientific and technical uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, now we want to go more to the policy part. Um, uh, and uh, we want to see and uh, discuss what the common agricultural policy and other EU policies um, could do for uh, peatland, uh, climate friendly peatland uh, management and use, and um, how the CAP framework could be amended to enable climate protection and, and other environmental benefits, as well as rural incomes from wet and rewetted peatlands. So, uh, we are very pleased that we got um, video messages from five MEPs um, um, from different member states and different political parties, and um, I will show them now in the video. And please don't forget, put your questions uh, into the chat, and um, we will have a second round of discussion, question and answer uh, afterwards. Sehr geehrte Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer, mein Name ist Peter Jau und ich bin Berichterstatter für die zukünftige Agrarreform im Europäischen Parlament. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie zum heutigen Webinar Moorgebiete in der neuen GAB per Video begrüßen zu dürfen. Mit dem Thema Politikultur, Moor, Feucht- und Hofgebiete bin ich schon sehr früh im Prozess der Reform der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik in Kontakt gekommen. Wir alle auch die Landwirtschaftspolitik müssen uns den neuen Herausforderungen stellen. Dazu zählt allen voran der Kampf gegen den Klimawandel und ein ambitionierter Einsatz für unsere Umwelt. Ich und viele meiner Kollegen sehen Landbewirtschaftung auf wiedervernetzten Mooren als eine der größten Chancen für den Klimaschutz, Gewässerschutz und der ländlichen Entwicklung. Daher setze ich mich dafür ein, dass die sogenannten Paludi-Flächen auch weiterhin als futterfähige landwirtschaftliche Fläche definiert bleiben. Ich begrüße den regen Austausch, auch unter derzeitig erschwerten Umständen, um das enorme Potenzial von Paludikulturen anzusprechen. Ich wünsche viel Erfolg bei den folgenden Webinar mit hoffentlich vielen interessanten Erkenntnissen. Ihr Dr. Peter Jahr. My name is Grace O'Sullivan. I'm a member of the European Parliament for Ireland South. I'm part of the Green Group in the Parliament and I sit on the committees of the ENVI, which is in the, the Environment, and I sit on PESH, I'm the coordinator for the Green Group on the Fisheries Committee. I just want to say that it's really important that we recognise the ability for peatlands and wetlands to sequest carbon and to help in the fight against climate change. 
And I'm hoping that farmers will see the opportunity to move from traditional farming to wetland peatland farming. And that if we use a new cap, there will be provisions made to support farmers to do this. Hello everyone. My name is Anja Hazekamp. I'm a member of the European Parliament since 2014. I represent the Dutch Party for the Animals, the first political party in the world that doesn't focus on the short-term interests of humans, but on the entire planet and all of her inhabitants instead. I'm a vice chair of the European Parliament's Environment Committee and a member of the Agriculture and Fisheries Committees. As a trained biologist, specialized in wetlands. I'm very happy to speak to you today. I spend a lot of time in the peatlands of Eastern Germany, where I fell in love with these invaluable ecosystems, not only because of their biodiversity, but also because of their beauty. Peatlands play an important role in the terrestrial storage of carbon, and therefore we need to protect them protect them against drainage, uh, protect them against urbanization, and protect them from intensive farming. The way we produce food is unsustainable and causes irreparable damage to our ecosystems. Therefore, Europe should end harmful agricultural subsidies and make a shift towards organic farming within the boundaries of our planets. Thank you. Dear organizers, dear participants to this webinar, my name is Norbert Linz, Chair of the Agriculture Committee in the European Parliament. Thanks for giving me the opportunity for a very brief comment. The reduction of greenhouse gas emissions is a challenge to, to us all. I'm convinced that agriculture will continue to play a vital role in cutting down emissions in the future. Peatlands might be one tool to help farmers achieve this goal. However, by doing so, we should make sure that they are being rewarded accordingly for their contribution to carbon storage. I wish you an interesting webinar and a lot of success with your deliberations for the future. My name is Marit McGuinness. I represent the Midlands Northwest constituency in the European Parliament and I work on the Agriculture and the Environment Committee. We have a lot in common in those committees. We're debating climate change and looking at land use. In the past, the European Union and national governments supported farmers to drain land and to put it into traditional agriculture. Today, we're debating land use and how it impacts on our climate. And we know that you can sequester a great deal of carbon in peatlands if they're managed in a particular way. But we have to find incentives and ways to support those farmers who are moving from traditional agriculture on those peatlands towards wetland farming on peatlands. And I hope we can achieve a policy that delivers on both. It would be a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, these were the nice common statements from uh, different members of parliament. And next we will hear Neil Brochlin to present the joint uh, policy paper, which was produced by a broad network of scientific uh, organizations and NGO, and uh, which is actually one of the uh, reasons uh, to present this for this webinar. So now you will see Neil presenting the paper. Hello there, my name is Neil Abrelacon and I am a former member of the Irish Parliament and I'm currently working as a researcher in the National University of Ireland in Galway. I'm working together with uh, colleagues from five different countries in Europe on an EU interreg project called Care Peace. Together with colleagues from the Greifswald Meyer Centre in Germany, 
Wetlands International and other colleagues from right across the European Union, we've put together a position paper for the Common Agricultural Policy. Now this position paper seeks to do two key things. The first is to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, from degraded peatlands and the second thing is to uh, make sure that farmers in the European Union get a better income. Now it's possible to do these two things together by re-wetting peatlands. Let's have a look at the global situation. Roughly one third of all soil carbon is stored in peatlands, whereas peatlands only cover roughly 3% of the global land area. However, degraded peatlands contribute to roughly 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Thankfully though, a lot of this can be reduced by simply re-wetting those peatlands. But to put things in context, roughly 5%, as we said, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally are contributed to by peatlands, whereas direct contributions from shipping and aviation only amount to 2% each. In terms of global carbon stocks, peatlands are the most significant ecosystem on the planet. In fact, they hold four times as much carbon as tropical rainforests, and they hold twice as much as a giant coniferous forest. Our cap position paper clearly shows where the peatlands are in Europe. Obviously, most of them are in the northern part of Europe, where it tends to rain a lot, because they're obviously wetlands. The key target of our position paper is to facilitate the new environmental ambitions of the post-2020 Common Agricultural Policy and to create coherence between agricultural and climate policies. CAP obviously must safeguard and stimulate preservation of carbon-rich soils through protection peatlands. Our primary goal is to guarantee eligibility of farmed wet peatlands for CAP payments to farmers. Our CAP position paper shows degraded peatlands right across the European Union. But it also shows that by re-wetting 3% of agricultural land, we can save up to 25% of agricultural emissions. So what we're trying to encourage is we're trying to encourage wetland farming rather than traditional rained, drained farming, polluticulture in other words, and we're trying to encourage carbon farming what we want to do is keep the carbon in the ground, not in the atmosphere, and keep our wetlands wet. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for all the contributions from the videos. Um, now we still have around 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, feel free to use the Zoom chat. Um, there are some questions uh, regarding the climate and emission ambitions. Um, the question is, um, how do we ensure that not all the ambitions are loaded onto farmers on peatlands and carbon-rich soils, while other sustainable, unsustainable incentive farming practices are allowed to continue with huge emissions and damage the environment? Um, Neil, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I, I just like to make some general comments in relation to, um, you know, damage to the environment, because um, unfortunately, re-wetting does really damage the environment in relation, sorry, not re-wetting, wet, um, draining damages the environment in terms of um, peatlands. And it's very important that we do keep wetlands wet. And this is going to become more and more relevant as um, climate change uh, progresses, because um, we're seeing even in Ireland now, um, you know, a drought situation. So there's a whole issue with water. There's a whole issue with biodiversity. And it's, it's extremely important that we get our policy right, because, you know, we, we might think that this COVID-19 crisis is, is a problem, but we ain't seen nothing yet because, <clears throat> quite frankly, you know, um, climate change is an existential crisis. And peatlands can play a huge role in terms of um, helping to, I suppose, at least reduce or alleviate the problems. So um, I, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a point of view. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, then we have a lot of comments here, also mentioning the EU biodiversity strategy, which is mentioning peatlands at, as carbon-rich ecosystems, which is good, and that we have to invest more into mapping the extent, conditions, services, and benefits from peatlands. 
um, to know where we have to invest and to highlight the high value of peatlands also in the light of the UN framework. Um, then we have a comment from Rob Stoneman from Rilo in Europe um, that currently in Poland farmers can receive 400 hectare per hectare for draining and mowing peatlands causing huge emissions and we need a cap to uh, reward um, land managers to keep carbon in the soil. Um, so there are more uh, there are more comments now coming up. Then there's one question on wind farms are often built on drain peat box. It's not so much related to uh, the cap, but anyway, important question. Maybe um, Francisca, can you say some words about that? Wind farms on peatlands? Because I know that you're currently also involved in such things <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I mean, nothing against wind farms in general. I think we, we also need them to, to produce energy. But for our region in Northeast Germany, we have a situation where uh, the degraded peatlands emit uh, three times the amount that our wind farms onshore and offshore are projected to save. So there's a larger importance in the drained peat soil. And that means, of course, also generally that uh, maybe it is possible to build wind farms on a peatland, but the peatland must be wet. And then you can think about solutions that this is a kind of like offshore uh, wind power plant then to build it in a wet peatland if uh, other regulations would allow it. Um, and uh, that's similar for uh, solar energy, for example. So I think we have we need to think about new innovative land use systems, about new opportunities, but the, the baseline must be that the peatlands uh, would be wet, would be a, a water table close to soil surface, because otherwise we continue with continu continuously with permanently uh, CO2 emissions. Then we have a question from uh, Luke Flanagan. Um, on again on how to ensure that not all climate emission uh, climate and emission ambitions are loaded onto the farmers on peatlands and carbon rich soils um who is requesting for for an answer um neil do you want to yeah. comment on can that I, again? can i comment on that um, just to recognize luke of course who is um one of our meps we have a number of meps and assistants online um, just to say that he's absolutely right, Th this is actually very important, a very important point, because certainly in Ireland, um, you know, a lot of the peatlands would not be, um, you know, purely to do with farming. However, just to point out that this is about um, the common agricultural policy, and the common agricultural policy deals purely with the farmers. So there is a much broader question in terms of um, peatlands in general, and the Natura 2000 sites, or indeed um, other sites. Um, one thing I'd be kind of concerned about is, is um, you know, protected land, which may may be used for polluticulture. But that's another question. Um, you know, I, I I think I think there's a whole commentary about this. But peatlands in general um, need to be protected as much as po possible because they're a huge um, <clears throat> carbon store. So, you know. It shouldn't be down to farmers, but there is a significant amount of the peatlands in the European Union actually are in um, land owned by farmers or by, you know, run by farmers. So that's um, really what we're focusing on today, but appreciated. The wider question is extremely important. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, then there is one more general question. Maybe I will uh, give that to uh, Francisca, maybe to clarify at the end the basics. What is, is there a EU definition for peatlands and how thick does peat layers on agricultural land need to be, to be included uh, into peatlands? No, there's no general definition uh, uh, across Europe. Uh, there are many definitions, but what is important in the climate context is uh, the carbon content. So uh, we talk about peatlands, but we can even use the wider term of organic soils, of carbon rich soils. And uh, we can well use the national definitions. They differ a bit, um, but, but they exist and peat, uh, soil scientists know where the peatlands are. And we have also, because there was one question about it, also a quite good peatland or organic soil maps at the national level. We simply have to use it um, and to uh, yeah, not uh, disregard these soils as important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm browsing 
through the comments and questions um, which we have here. Uh, there's also one question about rewetting. Is this a big investment? Anybody would like to react on that from the group? Anke, can you say some words about that or is it, do you have some idea? Um, I'm not sure if I'm the most qualified person to answer it, but um, of course um, you have to keep in mind that drainage is also a big investment and it costs money, it's not for free. It's just that it's usually society, at least in Germany, who pays for the costs for that. So um, investing in uh, blocking ditches or so might be um, not so expensive in relation to that if you take Can I share experience from Indonesia for the blocking canal? Hello? Yeah, please, just keep it very short. Yeah, uh, Indonesia helped do uh, some uh, rewetting uh, in the pitland restorations uh, with the blocking canal. We used the wood uh, logging from the forest and around there. It's just uh, for two or three years and after that it's gone. If we win concrete, it's very high and very expensive. In with uh, with uh, do like good science in the pitland. I think we have to do with repegetation. Repegetation, yeah. We plant the, the flan on the uh, canal so that it can uh, stop the water come out. I think it's good. Thank you. Thank you for this input from Indonesia. So we know that also the, the, the question of peatland use is not only relevant within the EU, but also for uh, products produced outside the EU and imported fast like palm oil. That this creates huge problems in, in other parts of the world. Um, we have many other questions here. Um, as I said, we will save the chat. We will record everything um, so that we can get back to you um, or you get directly in contact with us via email. And, um, but I would like to give the final word now because we are approaching the end of this webinar to Franziska Tannenberger to wrap up uh, and close the session. And I would like to thank all of you for participating in here, to raising questions, um, sending your opinion in comments, and to special thanks, of course, to all the contributor contributors uh, with the videos, uh, that's great. And I think it gave us a very good overview of what is happening at the moment in regard to land management. And now, um, Francisca, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And please stay online for the last two minutes, I think, uh, to wrap up uh, the session. Uh, we have traveled with you from drain peatlands in Ireland and uh, Poland uh, to revetted peatlands in Scotland, Germany. And we have heard and seen that um, re stopping peatland drainage um, is possible um, and that the revetted sites recover in some cases quite quickly and that um, they provide us again with essential ecosystem services including low greenhouse gas emissions compared to the drain condition and in many cases also uh, carbon sequestration again. We have also heard and seen now I will share my for last uh, three slides um, that there are uh, opportunities for farmers on wet peat soils. Um, <clears throat> wet so traditional or new forms of agriculture um, called paludiculture, but also opportunities like uh, carbon farming. Uh, a few pictures illustrating it. What is needed now is a better policy framework for it and an EU-wide uh, knowledge exchange that we do not invent the wheel several times in different parts of Europe. <clears throat> What we also need is new alliance to uh, fight for this. And uh, I think in this webinar, we also uh, found some of them. Um, <clears throat> it is essential um, <clears throat> um, that this uh, is uh, essential to bring us on a way, um, on a pathway to bring peatland CO2 emissions down to zero by 2050. This example here on this slide shows a pathway for Germany where we see um, the condition of peatlands at the moment. Most of them are red, they are dry. And uh, in the coming decades, until 2050, we need to move on to make them wet, in this case green, uh, to uh, bring down CO2 emissions to uh, close to zero. <clears throat> 
And um, this means that we have 30 years. Um, we should not wait, but 30 years is quite a long time. Uh, if you think of the changes in agriculture, for example, between 1950 and 1980, so there is room for innovation. There is space for young farmers to uh, shape their future uh, with their own ideas and means. And we should not forget uh, that postponing peatland revetting increases the long-term warming effect through continued CO2 emissions, as Anke has explained it. And as this figure indicates, uh, if we continue on one of the orange or yellow lines, um, or if we revet late in a green line, we will end with a higher global warming than on the blue lines or trajectories uh, where we start earlier with revetting. So it's a matter of time. And um, it's important to act now, both in Brussels and in the member states. Thank you very much. You're very welcome to read our position paper and to contact us and we will uh, keep in touch also with all the questions that were raised in, uh, in the chat. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Yeah, okay, thank you. From Indonesia, thank you. Thanks Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And please get in contact with us. I shared the emails, our emails in the chat. So if you have bilateral questions, please uh, get in contact with us. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.